Hello, everybody. Um, this is our sus second lesson on a theorist who looks at the relationship between structure and agency. So we're going to be looking at the work of Pierre Bourdieu and his attempt to try to understand the social reproduction of inequality. So let me talk about what the social reproduction of inequality is first, and then I'll show how that kind of brings in the concept of structure and agency. So what um, Bourdieu is interested in is how is it that the members of the upper class are able to pass down their class position to their children and to their grandchildren, right? How is it that, um, you know, upper class families are able to maintain themselves throughout or over generations? So let me show you an example of this uh, by showing a picture. If I can get to it, okay. So here we see um, a picture of what's called the Basel Getz. So on the left, you have Sir Joseph Basel Get. Um, he was a 19th century uh, sir, right? So he kind of had official kind of status in Britain, British society. And then that on his right is, is his great, great, great grandson, Sir Peter Basel Get who is also now a member of the upper class in Britain, right? He is um, in the Arts Council, Council of Britain, um, you know, he's kind of high up. And so what Bordeaux is trying to understand is how does that happen? Why is it that Sir Peter Balzaget is also in the same class position as his great, great, great grandfather? And in general, the question is, you know, how is that level of inequality reproduced, right? How is it that the members of the upper class are able to maintain their position generation after generation after generation? And, you know, and then the members of the lower class are able to maintain, you know, are, are kept in their position generation, generation after generation. And so, first of all, that's a question of structure, right? It's, the, it's you know, inequality, that class that division between class positions and who occupies those class positions, that's part of the structure of society. And so what Bourdieu is trying to understand is, well, how is that structure maintained? How is it reproduced, you know, year after year, generation after generation? And what he's gonna show is that that structure is maintained partly through the actions of humans, right? That humans are maintaining or helping to reproduce those structures through their actions. And so two concepts here that are gonna be important is the concept of field and then capital. So field is really gonna be part of the structure and then capital and, main, and getting capital is part of the actions of humans. So we'll see that that's part of that uh, connection too. Okay, so let's get into it. How does um, Bourdieu explain this? How does he explain how um, uh, inequality is socially reproduced over the generations. So he says that it's really about capital being passed down. And so normally when we think about capital, we think about money, right? We think about economic capital, right? That, you know, capital we can think of as your savings, right? Everything in your savings account, right? Is your capital. Right? And so one way you think about it is what's happening is that the capital of one person is being passed down to the children and then, then through successive generations, right? So somebody builds up a wealth of capital and then they pass that down and give it to their heirs. But what Bourdieu is going to say is, okay, yeah, some of that happens. You know, people inherit money from their uh, from their parents and their grandparents, and you know, and then that money is kept within the family, and that's how the, the whole thing is reproduced. But what Bourdieu is going to say was actually more complicated than that. It's not just passing down economic capital, but it's actually a conversion process between different forms of capital. And so what Bourdieu is going to say is that there's a conversion process from economic capital to cultural capital, and then cultural capital into social capital, and then social capital is then reinvested back into economic capital. 
And so there's this kind of whole conversion process going on and that helps reproduce uh, the level of inequality. So let's see how this works by going through uh, the different forms of conversion. So the first conversion form of conversion is the conversion of economic capital, right, into cultural capital. So economic capital is, um, you know, your wealth, your money, you know, how much you have in your, your savings account, um, it's your income, it's the value of your house, you know, things like that, your, your, your money, right? And so what uh, Bordeaux is going to say is, okay, you have some uh, parents, you have a, a, a couple, and they have a degree of economic capital. Let's say that they are wealthy. And so what they're going to do is, yes, they're going to pass some of that economic wealth down to their children. But more important than economic wealth, what they're going to do is they're going to provide their children from a very young age with cultural capital, right? They're going to convert the parents. They're going to convert their economic capital into cultural capital for their children. Okay, so what is cultural capital? What is this thing that they're, the parents are converting their money into? So what Purdue says is cultural capital is basically familiarity with elite forms of culture. Right? He says, okay, what we do in society is we create a hierarchy of cultural objects and cultural goods. And at the top of that hierarchy, somewhere up here, are elite forms of culture. Right? So he talks about things like, you know, knowing how to play golf, um, knowing art, uh, knowing what wine is good to drink, uh, knowing things like etiquette and politeness and knowing how to, you know, um, talk to people in a sophisticated way, grammar, right? He says all of that is cultural capital. It's a representation of your status. It shows this cultural capital, kind of like, you know, wealth shows um, how cultured you are. And so what he says is what happens is when people are born, just like they have no money, they don't have any cultural capital. You know, they're not sophisticated. When you're born, you don't know about art and you don't know about golf and you don't know about correct grammar or the correct way to hold a fork or any of that stuff. But just as your parents give you money, they also give you cultural capital. Right? They educate you. They, they teach you in the ways of the world. And what upper class parents do is they teach their upper class children how to be cultured, how to be sophisticated. Okay, let's get a little bit more into this idea of cultural capital. And we can break it down a little bit. So we know that cultural capital is knowledge of and familiarity with elite forms of, cap of culture. Um, Bordeaux breaks this down into three parts. He says, okay, let's break it down. We, we can talk about objectified cultural capital, we can talk about institutionalized cultural capital, and then we can talk about embodied cultural capital. And let's go through these one by one. Okay, so what is um, objectified cultural capital? Okay, so let's begin with objectified cultural capital. So objectified cultural capital are physical objects. They are physical objects that represent a certain degree of status, right? We might call these, and they have been called um, status symbols, right? What, they are, what are they symbolic of? They're symbolic of your class position, right? They're, they're symbolic of your level of you know, sophistication, your wealth, your degree of being cultured in the world. Right? So what might be some examples of these, um, you know, physical objects that represent status? So they're all around us, actually. And you can kind of, as I go through some of them, you can think about your own examples. But let's think about a simple example, um, cars. So cars are obviously, you know, uh, things that don't just drive us from A to B, but they represent something about who we are as people. They are a status symbol. So, you know, cars um, can go all the way from ordinary and boring, like uh, a Ford Fiesta, uh, to something very expensive and fancy, a luxury car, right? So we can think about a Mercedes-Benz or a BMW or, um, you know, other luxury cars, 
right? The whole idea of luxury, the whole idea of a luxury brand of cars is a, a form of objectified cultural capital, right? The idea that some cars are more better or sophisticated and not just because of their engine and not just because of their, you know, their features, but there's something about the brand that makes them better, right? That it's not just about owning a BMW because of the mechanics of it, but it's about owning a BMW because everybody knows you own a BMW, right? That it has that badge in the front, right? Or we can think about, you know, many different examples, right? We can think about um, uh, restaurants, right? You know, places where you can go to eat, right? You can think about, okay, what's at the bottom of that hierarchy? Oh, well, something like fast food, you know, something like uh, maybe Taco Bell or something like that. And then you go to, you know, a little bit higher, a chain restaurant, like the TGI Fridays. And then, you know, maybe you go a little bit higher on, you know, uh, a fancy chain restaurant, um, the Cheesecake Factory. And then you go all the way higher, you're like, oh, no, it's not a chain restaurant anymore. You know, it's a, its own restaurant. It's a fancy restaurant, right? A French restaurant, its own name. Maybe it has a celebrity cook, right? Or celebrity chef, right? And, you know, it is, you know, uh, you know, you have to get reservations to go in there, right? Again, though that ranking of restaurants is a status symbol. It's a ranking of, of how good that object is, right? So we can think, you know, we got an example of uh, cars and restaurants. And so what, uh, Bordeaux calls is it, it calls us the field, right? We can think about this as basically the hierarchy that we place objects, he says, within a field and we rank them up and down, right? Better to worse, higher or lower status. And we do this with cars, we do this with restaurants, we do this with clothing, right? We do this with sneakers, for example, you know, shoes you buy from pay less shoes versus, you know, fancy. Air Jordans, right? Right. And so obviously, what does all this take? Right? What do you need to have these objects at the top of the field? To have them, you obviously need money, right? You need uh, you need a fair amount of money to buy a nice car, a fancy car. You need a fair amount of money to get to buy uh to go to a fancy restaurant. You need money to get Air Jordans, right? And so what's happening here is you know, what, what's happening? You're converting your money into status, right? What's happening is a conversion process. You're taking your economic capital and you're buying an object as a status symbol and buy, what are you buying? You're not just buying the physical object, you're buying cultural capital in an objectified form. And so in this way, he says, um, consumption, buying objects, what you buy, what you can afford to buy becomes a symbol of your class position, right? And we see this with multiple objects. You can, you know, you can think in your head about other examples. So we have cars, we have restaurants, we have sneakers, we have uh, the cell phone that you own, uh, the, your laptop, um, the, your home, right? What area code you're in, um, the size of your house, whether you live in a trailer versus a mansion, right? All of this is not just about the physical comfort or the physical utility of that object, but also about the amount of status or cultural capital that object is going to give you, right? So he says all this, all these objects are imbued with cultural capital and objects with more cultural capital are more expensive, meaning that you have to have more money or be upper class to afford them. Being upper class allows you to purchase status. So that's cultural capital in an objectified form, in the form of physical objects. He also talks about institutionalized cultural capital. So that is basically educational certificates, right? And so he says, you know, it's basically education. Right? And so he says here, there's also a ranking. There's also a field of institutionalized cultural uh, capital right so let's think about this in terms of your own experiences right now right going to college right that there is a ranking of colleges in america and it's very clear and obvious so at the top somewhere we could put the ivies right we all know this we they even have a name the ivies 
right? You know, I Harvard, uh, Princeton, and now I'm forgetting some of the other ones, right? But you know that there's, um, you know, they're they're just supposed to be the elite colleges, and then you can go a little bit down, but not much down. You know, Yale and UCLA, and and then you'll go, you know, a bit for, and you, there's a whole ranking up and down. You know, somewhere in that line is going to be Plattsburgh. You know, it's going to be the Sunnis. Right? And there's even a ranking of the Sunnis up and down. And then below the colleges, you know, is, um, you know, maybe a community college or maybe, you know, a technical school. And then below that is, you know, no college degree at all. Oh, you just went to high school, right? You know, that, that doesn't give you much, uh, you know, much cultural capital. And so what Bordeaux is pointing out, something that we all know already, right? Uh, the reason that people go to college is not just to learn and gain skills, hopefully that's some of it, uh, but it's also to achieve a certain certificate, to achieve a certain cultural capital, right? To achieve a degree, right? A piece of paper that represents to other people, hey, I went to Harvard, I went to Yale, um, you know, I'm a sophisticated cultural person, right? And so that cultural capital that that degree is is giving you a certain degree of status in the world. So just like the BMW gives you status, you know the Harvard degree gives you status, right? And we rank the colleges and the institutions all the way up, right, up and down. So that's institutionalized cultural capital. Uh, what Purdue also talks about is he talks about what he calls, lastly, embodied cultural capital. Right? And this is connects with this idea of habitus. And so this is uh, a little bit harder to understand, but also one of the most important things. So what is embodied cultural capital? So he talks about embodied cultural capital as the internalized form of status or cultural capital that is put into a person from a very young age. It is the way you are socialized, it's the way that your parents raise you in a specific way from a very young age to give you a way of acting and behaving in the world and also a way of perceiving. It's a way of acting, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of feeling, it's kind of your very intimate and personal self. And what Bourdieu is saying is that yourself how you behave and act and think and feel has been shaped by your parents. And what happens is that upper class parents shape and socialize their children in very specific ways to ensure that they are acting in a sophisticated, culturally uh, cultured way, right? They are, for example, teaching their children manners. You know, oh, this is how you talk to somebody. This is how you speak in the world, right? This is how to be polite, right? And why, you know, you know why do parents want that for their children? You know, one is, you know, it's like, it's good, you know, to be polite and nice, but also being, having manners, having etiquette is a representation of your status, a representation of your cultural capital. You know, people perceive, see, you see it about you and you're like, oh, well, that person is, knows how to talk, knows how to speak, right? And so all that is embodied, meaning that it's, it's internalized within you from a very young age. We're talking like zero, one, two, three, four years old. You know, your, your parents are teaching you and, and upper-class parents in particular are making sure that their children behave in a very sophisticated, appropriate way. So, Bourdieu takes, calls this habitus. Right? He says that what happens is that different classes uh, socialize their children in different ways. Right? They bring and raise up their children in different ways such that now the children are raised and become different types of people. Right? It becomes part of their internalized psychology, right? the way they think and perceive the world. Right. And so this also takes money. Right. So like buying the car, you know, getting into Harvard, you know, the, that cost takes money. It also takes money to make sure that your children are, you know, uh, you know, being sophisticated. You know, what's examples of this? You know, piano lessons, 
uh, speaking a second language, going to Europe on a holiday, right? That makes your children more sophisticated and cultured, right? That takes money, right? You know, you're, you're opening your child's horizons, you're, right? You're making them, you know, more cultured in, in the world, right? It takes money. But what it also takes is time, right? Unlike objectified, you know, anybody, if they have money to win the lottery, can go out and buy a car. Anybody, if they have money and, you know, good enough grades, you know, can go and afford to go to college and go to a good college if you have a lot of money, right? And there's been a whole scandal about people donating money to get their children into a good college, right? Even though their grades might not have been that good, right? You have enough money, it, you can get the, the things that you need. But embodied cultural capital is different. It doesn't just take money, it takes time. Right, having manners, the way you speak, the way you talk, your accent even is not something that you can simply go out and buy, but it's something that your parents have to raise you to be. Right? And so it takes a, an incredible amount of time and kind of congeals with inside of you. You are hard, you know, it makes you into a type of person and becomes very difficult to change about yourself. And so he says, all of this, this even this embodied cultural capital is a form of status, right? It represents something about who you are to others. So people see the objects that you own, right? They see your phone, they see your car, they see the clothes that you wear. People see the type of college you want to, right? Your educational degrees. And they also see the way you act, the way you think, the conversations you can talk about, you know, what your grammar is like, you know, how you speak and talk, how you hold yourself. Right? And all of that is um, a degree of status, what Purdue would call a field. Okay, so all of that takes money, and, and sometimes it takes time as well, right? You're being cultured into it. So he, he, that's a first conversion process, right? Parents take their money and they convert it into cultural capital and give that cultural capital to their children. Right? They buy them nice clothes, they get them into good colleges, uh, and they raise them in a way to appear and be sophisticated. So now the question is, so what? Right? You're fancy now, right? You're Mr. Fancy Pants. You know, what does it matter that you are now uh, have cultural capital? Right? Uh, what's the big deal? Right? You know about golf, you drive a BMW, uh, you went to Harvard, uh, you're really good at your manners and etiquette, and you can speak French and Italian, and, and last month you went on a trip to Greece. So what? How, how does that reproduce social inequality? So the next step is that what Bourdieu says is, okay, now what happens is that that cultural capital is converted again. It's converted into social capital. Okay, so what is social capital? Social capital is basically your connections, your network, right? Social capital is the number of people that you know and the quality of those people, i.e. what class position are those people in? And so what happens is, um, Bourdieu talks about it as kind of like a secret club, or you know, talks about it as kind of, you know, people are very club clubby or cliquey, right? You know, just imagine back to high school that, you know, there's different cliques, right? You know, the cool kids, the slightly lesser cool kids, and then the geeks or whatever, right? He says, okay, in society, there are cliques, right? You know, there's also the cool kids of society and, you know, and they only let certain people in. But now these cliques, these adult cliques are based on class, based on wealth, right, based on your class position. And so what he says is, you know, there's a clique of upper classes, right, people who are upper class, and they don't only really want to hang out with other upper class people, right, they want to maintain their position in society, and they want to hang out with people who are like them, right, also in the upper classes. So how do you know somebody is also upper class? So you meet somebody for the first time, you know, how do you know that they're one of you? How do you know that they're also the upper class? 
you can't just go out and show people your bank account, right? That would be very crass and, and you know, that would be, you know, obnoxious and people would be like, oh, you know, what are you doing? No, you don't have to show people your economic capital. What you do is you show them your cultural capital, right? They know that you went to Harvard. They know that you have a nice suit on. They know that you arrived in a BMW. They know by the way that you talk and your conversations and how you can talk about your golf game and your handicap and you know, and which places you like to visit in Europe, right? They're like, oh, this person, he's one of us, right? And so what's happening is this cultural capital is not just for fun, it's doing something for you. Your level of cultural capital is opening doors. It's opening a door to the club of the upper classes. And so the way that um, Bordeaux talks about it is he says that, look, it's almost like a secret handshake, right? Your cultural capital is kind of like a little secret handshake that people in the know, know, oh, okay, this person, his manners, his etiquette, his college degree, the way that he talks, um, oh, they're, they're one of us, right? And so it's like a secret little handshake that two people do to each other that they so they know that they're members of the same class position. And it's happening even when other people don't realize it. Like if you're in the middle classes or you know lower down in the class position, you don't know that this is happening. You don't know what the correct rules are and you can't afford to get a BMW. But nevertheless, this opens doors for you, right? And so, so now what's happening is you're uh, converting your cultural capital into connections into social capital, right? Doors are being opened, right? Uh, and so, you know, he, he says specific examples of this, you know, it allows you to get into, you know, good colleges. You know, it's not just what your grades are, it's, you know, it's how you present yourself, it's your extracurricular activities, it's the essay that you write, you know, it's knowing people, you know, it's your parents knowing somebody in Harvard or Yale or something like that, and they get you in. Right? And so those connections are, are, are happening, right? And, the, and, and cultural capital is allowing you to get in. He says, you know, cultural capital is a tastemaker. It allows people to connect with one another. Okay, so now you got the social capital, right? So you've converted your economic capital into cultural capital, your cultural capital into social capital, right? What's the last step, right? You're the kid, right? You got all this cap cultural capital, you drive a nice car, you got a cool phone, you went to Harvard, you know your manners and your etiquette and your wine and your, your vacations, and now you're in, the, you're in Harvard, right? You got that social connection, and now you're in a good sorority in Harvard, and then after that, you know, you get a good, you know, you know all these connections of other upper class people. So what, you know, how does that help you? And Bur Burdu says, come on, seriously, it helps you a lot. Right? These connections allow you to get into good colleges. They allow you to get into good networks like a country club or a sorority or fraternity. They allow you to interview for a job. Right? They allow you to get a good job. They allow you to know about jobs. They allow you to get your foot in the door into places and positions that other people can't get into. And once you get into those positions, what, do that, what does that give you? It gives you economic capital. And so in the end, what happens is that social capital is then reconverted back into economic capital. And so it's this whole process, this kind of big cycle, economic capital converted into cultural capital, converted into social capital, and then social capital reconverted back into economic capital. And that through this conversion process, um, the, there is the social reproduction of inequality. Right? The upper class families maintain themselves. They help ensure that their children are uh, also going to be members of the upper class. And then their children's children will do the same thing. Will, what, will the same thing happen to them, right? That their children will do the same thing to their children, and then the family line will continue. So this is his basic theory of the social reproduction of inequality. And so what you get from this is it's also, also an example of structure and agency. There is a structure happening here, 
right? Inequality, you know, the ranking of humans and, and giving them certain resources in the world. And that these resources, this ranking is happening also by the actions of humans, right? That it's by people doing things, investing in cultural capital and investing in social capital that the inequality is happening, right? So it's both a structure and the actions of people.